Hello, I'm Lou Bloomfield and this is How Things Work. Today's topic, bouncing balls. Well, this process where a ball is dropped onto a hard surface and it rebounds to a, a fraction of its original height is, is simple and interesting of, it, of its own right, but it's also part of all sorts of ball sports and ball games. So we're going to look at that bouncing process and we're looking not only when the ball bounces off a hard and movable surface like, like this plate of aluminum, but also off of softer surfaces. Surfaces that give during the bounce and even surfaces that move during the bounce. So to start with, let's look uh, at the bounce itself and let's focus on energy. And a way to do this, I'm going to I'll tell you where we're going to go, and then I'll do it, I'm going to, and I'm going to hold on to the ball and do it slowly. So it's part of my hand. But we're going to watch the ball start with lots of gravitational potential energy, being high above the table, and convert that gravitational potential, ener potential energy into kinetic energy as it falls. Then make that energy briefly disappear, seemingly, from at least from view, during the impact, there's going to be a moment when the ball is not moving and it's not high. So it doesn't have gravitational potential energy or kinetic energy. And then the ball is going to rebound. It's going to have a lot of speed again, so it's going to have a lot of kinetic energy. And then it will rise back up and have a fair amount of gravitational potential energy. So that's, that's where we're going. And let's, let's now do that slowly. And we'll start up here where the ball the balls all the ball's ordered energy, the energy that's equivalent to work that can do interesting things, is in the form of gravitational potential energy. It's not moving, so no kinetic energy. When I let go of it, and I'll let go of it briefly so you can watch this happen, of course, the energy transforms from gravitational to kinetic. It's essentially a perfect transformation of air is making a little, messing things up a little. So it's neglecting the air, the transformation is perfect. Gravitational becomes kinetic. And just before impact, the ball is traveling quite fast, having converted all of its available gravitational potential energy into kinetic. It then hits the surface and slows to a stop momentarily. The kinetic energy is gone. It doesn't have gravitational, it doesn't have kinetic. Where did the energy go? Well, assuming a perfectly bouncy ball, which I will for the moment, then the energy has gone into the ball as elastic potential energy. During that impact, right, as the ball, you know, visualize the ball here, hitting the surface, it begins to dent. Its shape changes. And it's not a single, perfectly rigid object. There's no such thing. Uh, it, so it dents, and as the denting is occurring, from the perspective of the ball, so if we, if we adopt the ball's frame of reference, which is a little messy, but let's just do it anyway, the ball surface is being pushed in by what, what it's, the surface it's hitting. So it's hitting that aluminum. So, so instead of being perfectly spherical, ah, it's got a dent in the bottom. And that denting process involves pushing in on the ball as, the, as that surface ball part moves inward. There's, en there's work being done on the surface. Where the energy is coming from, ah, it's a little complicated, but it's coming out of the kinetic energy of the ball. So the ball is slowing down and the energy is going into deforming the ball, storing energy in it, like storing energy in a spring. Uh, it's not, I should say the ball is not, does not follow Hooke's law, so be careful. It's not per truly spring-like, but it's very, it, it's, it's similar enough that, that who cares. The ball comes completely to a stop, so it has, as I've said, no other energies except this elastic potential energy, and then it rebounds. And as it rebounds, the energy returns to kinetic form. And since I'm assuming a perfectly bouncy ball, all of the energy reappears as kinetic energy when the ball finally leaves this, the bouncing surface. And the ball then converts that kinetic energy into, into gravitational potential energy and returns to its original height. Back, you know, start, and return. All, the whole thing, and in fact, it's beautifully symmetric, the whole thing is, you can run the movie backwards, it looks the same. In reality, no ball bounces back to its original height when you drop it from, from rest. They all lose a little bit of height, at least. What's going on there? 
Well, not all of the energy that was invested in the ball surface by denting it goes into elastic potential energy. Some of it is wasted as thermal energy and is no longer useful to the story. It's not part of the ordered energy that's, that I was talking about earlier, the gravitational, kinetic, elastic, gra uh, kinetic, gravitational. It's gone from our story. In different balls, uh, waste large, different fractions of the original energy. So the, the fraction of energy that is returned, that comes back after the bounce, is known as the, uh, is known as the energy ratio. And it's a, it's a ratio that's always, you know, ideally it would be one, but it's always less than one. It's the, it's the ratio of the kinetic energy as the ball rebounds or alternatively separates from the surface divided by the energy of the ball as it approaches the surface or collides with the surface. So you could say rebound energy divided by collision energy, where collision energy is the energy the ball had as, it, as it's just about to hit, and rebound energy is the energy the ball had just after it hit, uh, specifically kinetic energies in both cases. So um, in this case, for this ball, I know that the energy ratio is a about 0.7 or 0.8. And how do I know that? Because if I look at how high the ball started, and therefore how much uh, gravitational potential energy it had, and I look at how high it was after it rebound, the ratio of those two, rebound height to, re to uh, drop height, that ratio is the energy ratio. Uh, that's, that's the energy it ended up with divided by the energy it started with. Uh, so this has an energy ratio of maybe 0.8, how about a golf ball? No, it's, it's about 0.7 or 0.8, something like that. Uh, how about a baseball? Terrible, maybe a, maybe a 0.25 or something. And how about, this is essentially a bean bag. It happens to be DBs in a bag, and it doesn't look like a ball, but from a physicist's perspective, it's a ball, okay? Terrible. Energy ratio, zero. No bounce at all. Okay, so it's nice to have a totally bounceless ball, um, just for, for language, it's, I, I tend to describe a ball like this that has a high energy ratio when approaching one as lively, and one that has a terrible energy ratio when approaching zero as, oops, as dead. <sighs> Pause. Continue. Uh, I just played pick up the BBs all over the place. There are still BBs all over the floor, and it's nice that they are magnetic, so I can pick them up with a magnet. Anyhow, I bet it's nice to have a, a, a completely non-bouncy ball as well. <sighs> all right, energy ratio is a nice way to characterize the bounciness or liveliness of a ball. It turns out, however, that a the, the conventional way to measure a ball's liveliness is, is, a, is a ratio that's different. It's known as the coefficient of restitution. Sorry, it's sad but true, that is the standard that's used in many ball sports to pin down what a ball can or cannot do. And what coefficient of restitution is, is the ratio of two speeds. It's, so it's a speed ratio, not an energy ratio. It's the ratio of the ball's approach speed to the surface, how fast it's going toward the surface, and uh, uh, the, the separation speed. What I'm pausing about is I want to reverse the order of these two, but I'll, I'll do that in a second. The, the two speeds that are important are how fast the ball approaches the surface and how fast the ball leaves the surface. So approach speed, rebound speed, or approach speed, separation speed. And the ratio is defined as the separation or rebound speed divided by the approach or collision speed. So it's a, again a, a, a number that's always one or less and it would be one only in the ideal perfect bounce situation. So for this guy, the, the rebound speed divided by the approach speed or collision speed is about 0.8 something. And how do I know that? Well. There is, is a simple relationship between the energy ratio and the coefficient of restitution ratio. Remember, kinetic energy is proportional to speed squared. 
So the energy ratio is the rebound speed squared divided by the uh, approach or collision speed squared. Masses cancel and stuff. So, so uh, it's, it shows up on both the numerator and denominator. So the, so the energy ratio only depends on speed squared, the, the final speed squared divided by the initial speed squared. The coefficient of restitution, therefore, is the square root of the energy ratio. If you square the coefficient of restitution, after all, is a speed ratio. So if you square it, it becomes an energy ratio. So this guy has an energy ratio of about 0.7 and has a speed ratio of square root of 0.7, which is about 0.8 something or other. Uh, golf ball. Baseball, the, en the energy ratio is about 0.25. So if you take the square root of that, you get 0.5 as the coefficient of restitution. And actually, baseballs are regulated according to their coefficient of restitution. It's got to be a little above 0.5. Um, it, it's very specific, but we don't need to go there. And this guy, of course, has an energy ratio of zero. I'm a little more careful about dropping it. It's energy ratio of zero, coefficient of restitution, zero. So that's the, the story, then, of balls bouncing off of rigid, immovable, non-moving surfaces. What happens if the surface isn't perfectly rigid? It's still not moving, but it can give. In that case, the energy that is invested into the, well, that, that's, that disappears during the impact. You know, remember, the ball was moving fast, moving fast, moving fast. It slows to a stop. Where did all the energy go? It was invested in the surface of the ball that energy that was put into the ball by denting it, if the surface isn't perfectly rigid, instead of going exclusively into the ball, it goes partly into the surface. So let's look again at, at the energy invested into the ball as, as uh, elastic potential energy. It goes into the ball, so here's, here's a, a, a cross section of a spherical ball. During the impact, the bottom dents inward flattens out a bit. And work is done from the perspective of the ball. Work is done on the ball's surface. Uh, and the energy goes into the, into the ball. Ideally, it goes into purely elastic potential energy form. In reality, some of it goes into thermal energy. If the surface also yields, or at least gives, dense, uh, so that it, as the two push on each other, the, the surface pushes on the ball, the ball pushes on the surface, if the surface dents too, it has work done on it, and it receives some of the energy. And now the question is, what does that surface do with the energy? If it squanders the energy, of course, it's going to it's going to it's going to uh, diminish the bounce. If it stores the energy beautifully and returns it to the ball during the rebound, it probably will improve the bounce. Um, and the, sur the 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 surface you hit with the ball, the surface's contribution to the whole bouncing process depends on its softness. The softer it is, the more it dents instead of the ball, and the larger the fraction of the original collision energy, the energy that was in the ball's kinetic energy prior to impact, the larger that fraction uh, goes into the surface. So softer surfaces receive more of the collision energy and become responsible for more of the bounce. Well, that means that if a lively ball hits a dead surface, one that doesn't contribute, that, that's soft but yields and, and just makes them, just ruins the energy, the lively ball won't bounce very well off of a dead surface that's soft. And similarly, a, a dead ball that impacts a lively surface that's soft will invest a lot of its energy in the lively surface, which will cause the uh, rebound. And I can illustrate both of those. So here is a lively surface, just, just air in a, in a Ziploc bag, and a, we, what we know is a dead, a dead ball. And this thing won't bounce significantly off of a hard, immovable surface, but it will bounce pretty nicely off of a lively surface. This is, I'm, being, I'm being so, so hesitant here. It, it, still, it bounces, and this is, this is how a trampoline works. People are not, you know, when you're bouncing on a trampoline, you're the ball. And you are not a very lively object. If we drop you on cement, 
So if we drop you, however, onto a trampoline, the trampoline does most of the denting and stores the energy beautifully and rebounds. It helps you rebound nicely. So you bounce nicely off trampolines, not so, not so well off cement. So that's this example. The other possibility is a lively ball trying to bounce off of a dead surface. So this is a whole, whole jar full of, of BBs. It could be sand. Uh, it could be beans. They're all very dead surfaces. So even a lively ball doesn't bounce well off that. Golf ball and foot. I mean, uh, baseball. So a dead surface that's soft, that yields nicely when the ball hits it, wastes all the energy and you get a terrible rebound. So, okay, so we've seen so far that balls, when they bounce off of rigid and movable surfaces, the ball does all the bouncing and we sort of get, end up observing the characteristics of the ball. We've seen that when a ball bounces off a not so rigid object surface, uh, we start to see the characteristics of the surface, how well it bounces. What about if the surface can move? If the surface can move, and now the, 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 it, its motion gets involved in the rebound. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this ball, this bouncy ball, bounce not off of the surface, a hard, rigid, you know, it's essentially a rigid and movable surface right now that's, that's not moving. If I do the same thing off, off of this plate of aluminum, as it's rising, the ball, instead of bouncing just to a fraction of its original height, will probably bounce right out of the camera view. Ready? You know, it's off on its own adventure. And it'll, it, <laughs> I can go rescue it. I'll go rescue it. Back in a moment. OK. So the, the point is, when the ball bounced off the moving surface, and the two actually were approaching each other and experiencing kind of a head-on collision, the rebound was especially intense. I, I actually toned it down. I've done this a couple times today. And I can, I can hit the ceiling with it. No problem. Why did that happen? I mean, I started with a ball not moving all that fast, and then a, a plate not moving all that fast. I ended up with a ball going faster than anything in the whole previous story. The physics behind that is this, that when I dropped the ball and it approached the plate, just before impact, the plate and ball were heading toward each other from our current frame of reference. Right? They're both moving and their approach speed of one toward the other was quite fast. It was the sum of their two individual speeds. So if this was going up at one kilometer per hour and this was going down at one kilometer per hour, they were approaching each other at two kilometers per hour. Uh, this is analogous to, to what happens on, on the highway when you're on an undivided highway with cars going both directions. If you're going 60 miles an hour towards Richmond and the other car is coming at 60 miles an hour away from Richmond and you pass each other, you don't want to hit each other, your approach speed is 120 miles an hour. It's, you're, you're, you sum the two speeds in that case when it's head on. So that's, it's a, the, the approach speed is quite high. And therefore, the amount of energy available to the ball, it's, its kinetic energy, from the frame of reference of the plate, it's coming, it, the ball is approaching twice as fast as it would have been approaching a motionless plate. That's four times as much kinetic energy. There's a lot of kinetic energy now in the story, way more than, nor than we had before. And a, even 70% a, you know, of that comes back to the ball. This ball now has a lot of kinetic energy from the perspective of the plate. We can, we can do this in terms of speeds. Uh, it's probably easiest, and so using the coefficient of restitution would be the appropriate thing. But, but I'm just going to talk us through this kind of uh, in general terms. As the two approach each other, the ball is coming at, at the plate very fast. Um, it rebounds at nearly that, that original speed, because remember this is a very lively ball. It leaves the plate traveling almost as fast from, away from the plate as it was traveling toward the plate. So it was coming at, I picked a number, two kilometers per hour toward the plate. It's leaving at two kilometers per hour from the plate, or very close to that. But the plate itself is, is rising upward from our our ordinary frame of reference. The plate itself was rising upward at one kilometer an hour. 
if the ball is going two kilometers an hour away from the plate to see what the plate, what the ball is doing from our ordinary frame of reference. We have to add those two velocities. We, we start with the, the velocity of the plate, which is up at one kilometer an hour, and we add to it the ball speed away from the plate, its velocity away from the plate, which is two kilometers an hour. That's three kilometers per hour upward. The ball is traveling upward now, assuming perfectly, perfectly bouncy, at three kilometers an hour, faster than any speed in the story. Remember, the ball's descent speed was, was one kilometer an hour, the plate's rise speed was one kilometer an hour, and we ended up with the ball traveling three kilometers an hour from, from our ordinary perspective? And the answer is yes. This is how batted balls end up going so fast. They approach, the, the bat and the ball approach one another, then they separate from one another, and the ball ends up moving relatively fast away from the bat, which itself is moving. And so you add the velocities, and the ball is going quite fast. And it's not always just a bat, okay? It's a bat in baseball, but many other sports have, have impact, objects that impact the ball, including your leg, your hand, leg in, leg in soccer, uh, uh, hands in, uh, in volleyball, and uh, you can end up with balls traveling very fast because of this, in, the, these head-on collisions leading to very strong bounces that are themselves bouncing off of objects that are moving already. Okay, so that's bouncing off of moving surfaces. What about surfaces that have a lot of ability to, 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 to move internally? Um, if, if a ball bounces off a surface that is not infinitely massive and stuff, the object's gonna do stuff, do things. The, uh, a bat, for example, a baseball bat. A baseball bat is not infinitely massive, and, and when the ball and bat collide, yeah, the ball bounces, but the bat bounces a bit too. The bat actually ends up uh, be affected by the impact, and it can end up having received uh, momentum in a certain direction or angular momentum in a certain direction. So the bat's dynamics become interesting already, and how the bat, how, the, how that impacting object, the bat or a golf club uh, or a field hockey stick, how they respond to the impact with the ball is, is part of these sports. Uh, there is, however, one other additional way in which a bat-like object can respond to the impact, and that is it can begin to vibrate. And it's worth paying a little bit of attention to that. It's certainly part of the sports. And to illustrate what I mean by, by the bat or bat-like object beginning to vibrate, I'll look at this stick. So, so this is an aluminum, aluminum rod here, this is a square bar. And it has mass and, and rotational mass, and so a uh, ball hitting it is going to affect its, its momentum, its angular momentum. All oh, that's nice and you know, interesting story, but not super interesting. We'll leave that alone for right now. What the, this thing can do also, though, is it, is it can change its shape. It doesn't, it's not truly rigid. Nothing is truly rigid. This bar can flex. And the flexure that I have in mind has many ways it can flex, but the one I care about at the moment is, is it bending uh, into a bow? Here, here now I've got a bow down, here's a bow up, back and forth like this. And there's actually two points I'll try to get. Two points, if I, if I, if I my hand, is, my hand should just be twisting, not moving up or down. The middle goes up, the, the ends go down. Here's the middle down, the ends go up. This is a flapping motion. And the parts where my hands are, uh, essentially don't move in this motion. So can I get it going? I have to hold it in the middle to get it going really nicely. And now, uh, I don't know if I can illustrate the parts that sort of sit, sit still. There's a frame of reference problem in all this. And we're not, we, um, there are complications. But that flapping motion, which I certainly can get going strongly, is something that occurs in, in certainly in baseball bats and in surely a, a wide variety of other club-like uh, things for hitting balls where the ball bounces off of a club. This motion requires energy. This, this bar is essentially a spring, um, and to bend it away from its equilibrium shape requires work, and the energy is stored as, as a, an elastic potential energy in the bar. And the energy is going back, in this case, back and forth between potential energy and kinetic energy, and potential energy, kinetic energy, blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. So when you hit a baseball with a baseball bat, and the bat 
you know, it doesn't, it's not exactly a simple bar like it's more complicated, but when, when the bat begins to flap like this, which it can do, some of the energy that would have gone into the ball and made it go far goes into the bat so the ball doesn't go as far. So it's not desirable to start flapping motions in a baseball bat. Uh, among other things, serious flapping motions in a baseball bat can break the bat. So when you hit the bat, sort of along the middle, the ball hits the middle of the bat uh, at a certain direction on the grain. Typically, if it, the ball hits the label on the bat, they put it there sort of for a reason. If the ball hits that label, it will, it will tend to break the bat in half. And that, you know, for better or worse, so it's there, it's, sometimes it's actually a strategy to have a bat break, or strategic, or at least it's lucky. Um, to avoid that, that, that vibration, to, to minimize it, one way to minimize it is to have the ball hit the spot where I illustrate with my hands, the spot that doesn't move with, during the flapping motion, the pure flapping motion, the parts I'm holding with my hand, in principle, don't move. Uh, this, incidentally, is the motion of a xylophone plate. When you play the musical instrument of the xylophone, that flapping motion is what the plate does. And this plate is deliberately supported at these points that don't move as the flap occurs. And they're known as nodes. Uh, the points of the, of the flapping motion, the most extreme flapping motion, are known as anti-nodes. But the nodes themselves don't move. And you can support the tine there, the, the, or the plate there. Uh, in the case of the bat, if it, it, I should continue with xylophone. <clears throat> if you support the xylophone at, at those nodes, and try to play the xylophone by hitting the nodes, you get nothing. It doesn't play the, it doesn't cause the flapping motion. And similarly with the baseball bat, you don't support the baseball bat at its nodes. But if you hit, if, you have, if the baseball hits one of the baseball bat's nodes, it doesn't cause the flapping motion. So the sound of the impact is very clean. There's no buzz associated with the flapping motion. The flapping motion on a baseball bat makes noise, just like a xylophone time. You can hear it. And so if the baseball bat, baseball hits the bat, not, uh, if the baseball hit bat hits somewhere where it causes the flapping motion, you hear bzzz. If the baseball hits the baseball bat on the node, no buzz, clean, crisp, smack sound. And the person who, who's played baseball for a while knows the ball's gonna be well hit and look for it far, look for it to go a long distance. So on a baseball bat, there's a sweet spot on the barrel of the bat, where, which is the vibrational node that you're looking for. That's where you want to hit the ball if you want the ball to go as far as possible. It doesn't cause the bat to vibrate. Break. It doesn't put energy in the bat. It's not going to break the bat. Um, so dealing with the bat's vibrations is part of the sport, and that's going to be true of many other ball sports as well. How, you, how and where you hit the ball or the ball hits matters. So that's the story of bouncing balls. We've seen bouncing balls off of hard, rigid surfaces where the ball is showing you its bounciness, whether it's lively and bounces well or dead and bounces poorly. We've seen bouncing off of a surface that is itself lively or dead and that is soft enough relative to the ball to participate in the bounce. And we've seen bouncing off moving surfaces and how that relative motion affects the bounce and often leads to very strong bounces. Or I should say also very weak bounces. If you bounce off of a surface that's moving with you, you get bunt-like effects, very weak bounces. And lastly, I talked about impacts off of, off of surfaces that don't have infinite mass and infinite rotational mass, or finally, infinite rigidity. Suddenly the surface gets involved in the bounce, actually, it actually bounces or it vibrates, and that contributes to how the ball bounces. And with that then, I'll leave the story of bouncing balls.